<clears throat> We're going to look at a parable there in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. This morning, and we're going to, it's the parable, what we call the parable of the talent. And, uh, <clears throat> but we're going to kind of focus in on one particular part of it just for just a minute. And we're going to ask the question this morning Do I know God? And that would be, Do you know God? Do I know God? And that might be a good question. You might think, Well, yeah, I know God. And, uh, and you might, but, uh, you might know him very well, and, and I hope we do. But there is uh, the possibility that uh, we might not know him like we think we know him. And that's what we want to try to study this morning for just a minute. So let's read the parable, and then we'll make a few applications. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants, and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with, with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one, went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants comes and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought forth five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord, he also had that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents besides them. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruder over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strong, strawed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. And lo, there thou hast, that, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to put, have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. But therefore the talent take therefore the talent from him and give it to, unto him which hath the ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he has. And cast ye the, the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a lot in that particular parable, and uh, a lot could be t said about it in various and sundry ways, but I do want to pick, uh, zero in on that one particular point that we'll see here in a second. Many people are absolutely sure about many things. Now, we talked about that a little bit this morning in class, didn't we? Paul, or Saul at the time, was absolutely certain he was doing something good for God, and he thought he knew God, and he was... Uh, wrong about that, wasn't he? So we can be absolutely sure about something, many things, and be dead wrong. I've experienced that in my life over and over again, and I know we all have at some point in time. But some situations, some things, this mistake really don't matter, right? Now I can believe and make make the uh, make the assumption and and go around and and proclaim that the. The moon's made out of green cheese. And or there's green cheese on the moon. And just go right on and think that and make my make my mistake about that, right? And it really don't matter, does it? In the end of things, it's not gonna make any difference whether the cheese the, the moon's got cheese on it or not. So that kind of thing don't really but other situations it can make a, a drastic change or uh, have a drastic effect on your life. When it comes to knowing God, 
when we think about knowing God, understanding God, being in a relationship with God, we need to be sure that we truly know Him and have not created some kind of illusion in our minds about Him. And I think that probably, you know, several years of my Christian life, I, was, I had some kind of illusion about God that really wasn't true. Now, we can get into those kind of a trap, that kind of a trap in our lives, and we can have this illusion about God, and we can be terribly wrong about God. And, and for example, as we talk about the idea of how God's grace works, and we can be, we've totally missed that in a lot of ways, in, in, in the brotherhood, I believe, about how God's grace operates in our lives and how we can enjoy that grace and how we need to recognize God and how graceful God is. So we can have illusions about God and we can have or misillusion or dis disillusion about God. So what is an illusion? Well, illusion is a thing that is, is or is likely to be wrongly perceived or interpreted by the senses, you know, our feelings. And so we get this uh, these illusions about God and it's not a good thing so how well do we know God that's a good question isn't it? how well do we now you notice what I said we uh, that's us you me how well do we know God and uh, that's a good question and it's a fair question because we want to know God don't we and we, we really want to know him. I want to know about him. I want to know how he feels about me, how he operates, and all and on and on we can go about how we want to know God. Well, this parable, I believe, will help us a little bit. It'll help us see God for who he is. And that's what we want to talk about this morning and see if we can zero in on some ideas about this. So... The background for this lesson is, is kind of, uh, you have to get just a little bit in that setting. And it's, it's mainly to Jesus' disciples and just a few days or hours before he would be crucified. And as we talked about in the uh, preparation for the Lord's Suppers, we read and we talked about things to come. And Jesus recognized that these, these men were going to have to have some instructions. They're going to have to have some encouragement. And this is what he began to talk about. And he talks about that he brings this parable to their attention. So we get the idea, really, is we think about the background for the lesson. You have the disciples there, and he's instructing them about, basically, service. And so you've got to get that in your head a little bit to understand maybe some of the intimate things that was going on in that parable as Jesus taught the disciples there about it. Mainly to the disciples, and it was a few days before he was crucified. And so, take a particular notice, though, of what the one talent man said. That, that's what I wanted to zero in on. Because the, the first two, obviously, they went out and they, they accomplished what God would have them to do. And by the way, if you look at the parable and you think about the parable, the, of course, the, the master there would represent God. And the, the servants there would represent the disciples. And so you, you obviously recognize that Jesus was talking about things in a spiritual sense here and using a parable to do it. So uh, you think about the first two. One was five, the second was two, and they both went out and multiplied those things and brought them back to the Lord. And then this last one, and if you start zeroing in on his thinking and the way that he was approaching God, and what the one talent man said about the master who represents God in the parable. Look at it. Here's verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. Now, you look at that and you think, well, what's going on there? And then you begin to think about it. The one talent man made unwarranted excuses and accusations toward the master. He charged the Lord with being harsh and merciless and unrelenting. Now, I'll just go ahead and tell you, <clears throat> if you 
listen to some preachers, you get that idea pretty quick that our God is merciless. He is unrelenting. That He is harsh. And that He will just strike you down and send you to hell and not bat an eye. But that is not the case with God. And as I, I wrote an article for the paper or the bulletin, God does not want us to be lost. He don't want us to be lost. He does not want us to suffer. He just don't do it. And he, is, he wants us all to be saved. And it is part of God's greatness, greatness that you see this idea of God's grace and mercy and kindness and love and, and watch care and all those things about God. And here's this one tattered man he comes along and says, I knew you, I knew you was going to be hard. And I knew that you was not going to uh, be fair. Really is what he's saying, right? I know you're harsh, man. You're merciless and unrelenting. And so here's this man's attitude. You begin to see this man and you see him for what he really is here in this idea coming to our attention. He accused the Lord of being unethical and reaping where he had not sown. Now you read that parable and you think, well, he was a, the Lord agreed with him. He did not agree with him. What he, the Lord is, the argument the Lord's making there is, well, you knew that. Why you, if you knew this about me, why didn't you go out and try to do your best to overcome that, right? But he didn't, did he? And so he makes these accusations against God. Now, we might take a little side trip here. Have we, ever been, have we ever been guilty of this? Have we ever been guilty of, of, of charging God with being unmerciful? Or, you know, relentless in our lives? You know, we might pray for this or that and it just don't come like we think. And we say, God, you know, you ain't even listening to me. I've prayed about this 50 times. And here I am, still right where I'm at. You're not even helping me, Lord. You're not even giving me any mercy. You ever get that in your mind? You might. And so you wouldn't be far behind this, this uh, one talent servant if you had that kind of attitude. God intends for us, as we talked about Paul this morning and the things that he was dealing with and the things that he was, uh, you know, that his life would bring him to, God intends for us to deal with. And he didn't make those things in our lives. We did. And so what we have to do is we have to learn to... Say the psalm. Say, uh, say Psalm twenty-three. You ever, you ever memorized that psalm? Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. And on and on, you start looking at those things that, that he talks about in that psalm. Give us comfort. Well, well, is that going to help me with my life and my and and the, this attitude that I would have like this particular servant? Yes, sir. Because it helps us realize that God has made provisions for us to be what we ought to be. Here comes this ungrateful, this, un, this, uh, this, un, this one talent servant and makes these terrible, unwarranted excuses and accusations to, uh, against our Lord. We have the same example in Adam. You ever think about that? Way back there. So this is not a new thing, and this one talent servant was certainly not a, a novelty in the way that he would approach God. So we have the same example in Adam who basically blamed God for his sin. You ever, you ever read that? And what does he say to God? When God finally does come to him in the garden and say, where art thou? And <clears throat> somebody said, well, they, he, God already knew where they was at. He did know where they was at, but he wanted them to say where they was at. Where are you? And he said this, and the man said, the woman who you gave me, she gave me the tree and I did eat it. See what he's doing there? He's blaming God. He's blaming her. He's blaming God. But whose fault was it? It was Adam's fault, wasn't it? It was Adam's doings. And so, so this is basically what you find, this theme of people trying to blame God for their problems and their sin over and over again in the Bible. And here's this one talent man doing the same thing. Was a master a hard man? When you look at this text, when you look at this thing and you read it, was he hard? 
Was he unfair? Was, was he unreasonable? Did he have unreasonable expectations of these servants? And so you, you got to ask that question, right? The one talent man said he was. So he, he, made that, he made that statement. He made that accusation. But I'm, on here, I'm here to tell you just because you read that, if he says that in the Bible, you say, well, he said that in the Bible. Well, it don't make it so. You know, the Bible records a lot of things in the Bible that's not true. People say the things that are not true in the Bible, right? And so he made this accusation against God or against the Lord. But was he correct in his assessment of, the ma of his master? Did you look at the rewards as they were categorized in the, in the parable? That kind of gives you a clue as how fair the man was. He gave one five according to his talents. Now, a talent, now there's this money, okay? It's basically talking about money. And so according to the historians and the scholars, that it was worth over $1,000. Now, that's a lot of money, right? So you have one with five talents, and, and, and he went out and doubled his. Two talents, he went out and doubled his. And the one talent, what would be the next logical thinking in your mind? Well, he come back with two talents, right? Oh, that's right, yeah. So that was what the Lord was expecting. The Lord was expecting that one with the five talents to bring more than the one with the one talent, obviously. But the one with the one talent was expected to bring his due uh, work, and that was to multiply the talent by one. And so was he unjust? Was he unrealistic? Was he, what was the word uh, we used there? Uh, uh, did he have unreasonable expectations of all these servants? And the answer that we get from the context itself is no, right? Uh, so when you look at these rewards, this is a good case of someone, the one talent man, that did not know what he thought he knew. And he comes out with this rash accusation and excuses about why he couldn't serve God and serve the Lord. So let's test our thinking for just a second and see if we know our master. How well do we know God? Well, let's see. Have we imagined perhaps a God who honors relationships over obedience? Now, what do you mean relationship over obedience? Well, we have a relationship with God, right? Those of us that have been baptized into Christ, we have a relationship with God. Most people, well, I wouldn't say most, some people, when they're baptized into Christ and they've had their sins removed, God has put them in the church. They are now in fellowship with God. That's the end of it. I come on Sunday morning, get my cracker, my juice, I go home, throw my dollar in the tray, and I'm done. I've got, my, I've got my part done. Well, that's a relationship, right? Uh, but what about the obedience part? So sometimes we may think that we could just we have this relationship and God is going to ignore the fact that we're supposed to be obedient and that will not work. It just don't, it don't jive, it don't wash. And here's some examples of that in the Bible. Now, in 2 Chronicles 26, way back there, remember I told you that, Back there where all those names are. Well, Uzziah is one of them. And he's a king. And the Bible says that they put him in the, on the, in the, the, the position of king when he was 16 years old. That's the age of your son. I don't understand that, okay? But, but they did that. And he reigned for 50-something years. 50 years he reigned. And the Bible says that he, that he was one that would do what God would have him to do. Right? And so he reigned those 50 years, did that what was right, the Bible says, in the sight of God. And what was his secret to that success? You say, well, what was, the, what was, what was his driving force? Well, he, we've, he, he consulted with God, and he did that through the prophets. And 2 Chronicles 26, verse 5, the Bible says, And he sought God in the days of Zechariah. One of those books that we've been memorizing, right? One of those prophets. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. 
Now notice this part that I've got hi highlighted there. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Can we hang on to that just a second? Can we, can we camp there in our minds for just one minute? As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Well, that's a little bit of an insight and a clue to the fact that there's more to relationship. There's more than just the relationship with God. There's, there is the seeking after God. You know, we, we do that in a relationship, don't we? We seek after one another. And we, we aim to please one another. We try to help one another. We love one another. And we look after each other's best interests, right, in a marriage. And so here's God come along and say, well, I, now we're married to Christ. We're in the bride of Christ. And we have this, this concept here of the fact that we should seek after God. Well, do we do that? Do we want to know God? Sometimes we really don't want to know God, do we? If we got something in our brain that this, you know, we love and we, it's something that I enjoy, and, and, and we don't want to seek God. We don't want to know God. Well, here's a man did. He wanted to know God. He sought after God. And as long as he sought after God, he was made to prosper. That should be a flag for us in our Bibles. That should be a flag for us in our life. We should be a people who seek after God. We want to know God, don't we? Well, he made war and defeated the Philistines and God helped him. See that? And I meant to have those animated, and I didn't. So I just I exposed my points early, that's all. He fortified Jerusalem. He dug wells for cattle and farming. This is all in that text in Second Chronicles 26. He had a well-equipped army. Look at that army. 307,500 men. And look at this latter part. Along with new mechanized weaponry. Yeah, he had some state-of-the-art stuff back there. Right? You read that in that, cha in that chapter. Check it out. Yeah, he had some real uh, fancy weaponry that he had developed. And he would post this weaponry in all those towers that he talks about he builds around Jerusalem. And out into the, the farming positions, he would have, he had it fortified. And so all those things. Well, what is that? Why? How, how's this going on? Remember what we said. What was it? Where was it? Right there? Uh, let's see, where was it? Right there. Remember what we said? As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. So he had a big army. He had a lot of farm. He loved cattle. The Bible says he loved cattle. And so he had cattle farms. He had an army. He fortified that city. He had all this technology on his side. Well, why? Because he was seeking after God, right? All these things come to be. Now notice this. There's that dreaded word right here. But. You know, when you see that word, something fixes and change, right? Now it might be for the good. It might be for the bad. And I'm going to tell you right now, it wasn't for the good, right? But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. You say, well, well, I mean, he was, he was seeking after God, wasn't he? And he was, obviously, he was very successful. And so you get, what you get out of this is, is that he had got to the point where he was so successful, he said, well, I can take over the priest's job, I can go into the temple, and I can burn my own incense. And the, the, the priest went in and implored him to get out of there. You are not to be in this temple. That is not your place. That is the priest's place. According to the law, you ain't supposed to be in there. And as they talked with him, the Bible explains to us what happened to him. And it wasn't a good thing, right? So God struck him with leprosy. And he lived out his life as an outcast. That's not a very good story, is it? You know? Well, man, he started out good, and then he 
then this is his end. That's the way this, that's the way this story ends for this man. He died, he, he, he has leprosy and they put him outside the city and he stays in a little hut outside the city for the rest of his life as a leper. Well, what's that all about? What are we talking about here? We're talking about the attitude of this one talent man and how we can make application with that and thinking that somebody knows God and you think you may have this illusion about God and he thought, in his mind obviously, that God would accept him going in and doing something he had never been told to do. Now, can we, can we relate to that? Yes, sir, you can relate to that. You can get so cocksure in your faith that you say, I don't really need God anymore. And Paul tells us, be, be warned about that. Take heed, lest you, take heed how you stand, lest you fall. Right? So, certainly we see that. We've got to be careful how we think we know God. What is our application? We should not imagine a God who accepts relationship over obedience. Okay? Now can we get another one there right quick on that point? And I ain't got one more point, so it's not going to be long. Remember Saul, not Saul of Tarsus, but Saul, King Saul, back in the Old Testament. There was a Saul back there. He lost his kingdom. Right? God took his kingdom away from him. Well, for, well, why? Well, look at this verse, 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, As the Lord, as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to hearken than to the fat of a ram. Well, you've got to look at the context of that, and you'll recognize that he had been told by God to go into this place and to utterly destroy all the occupants of that particular territory. But Samuel didn't. But uh, Saul didn't do that. He decided that he would save some of the the ox, the the the, the, the goats and the sheep and the, the and the and the animals, and he saved the king. Said, "Well, we'll we'll take care of him. And do it another way." And that's not what God told him to do. And so, what was the result of that? Same thing we've been talking about. He thought he knew God, didn't he? He thought he was doing something that. He thought he knew God just like what, what God would want him to do, but that's not what God said to him. And so we may have this illusion about God thinking that we have a relationship and we don't necessarily have to be obedient to the things he's commanded. Be careful with that kind of thinking. Have we, here's the last point. I think it's the last point. Have we imagined, might be one more, God that a God that demands or God that demands perfection along with our faithfulness. You know, I think I've been hung up on that for years. I, I, I thought that when you become a Christian that you had to do everything perfect, right? You had, to, you had to walk that line. And if you stepped off that line anywhere along the way, you was doomed to hell. But now I'm going to tell you right now, those people we talked about back there just now, you know, we, we have no right to put those men in hell. God will be their judge. And, uh, you know, like we talked before, they make mistakes just like everybody else. But here this is. So have we imagined a God that demands perfection along with our faithfulness? I think sometimes we, we equate that, right? With our faithfulness is perfect. Makes us perfect. And that could be further from the truth. And all you got to do, if you don't believe that, just look in the mirror. We're not perfect. None of us are. And we continue to make foolish mistakes in our lives. And we'll do it till we die. Because we're human. And that's just the way we're made up. Thanks be to God that we don't have one that will zap us every time we make a mistake. And, and send us to hell. That's not the way it works. That's the beauty of God's grace, right? Is this, is this what we have been looking at in our study of Uzziah, uh, Uzziah and Saul? That God demanded perfection out of them? If you think that, you need to go back and restudy that. Because that was not what God was. And you start looking at all these characters and you realize that, man, they had their flaws, right? Now here's Isaiah. He God didn't strike him dead, but he did suffer the consequences of his sin, didn't he? Here's Saul. He didn't strike Saul dead and send him to hell, but he suffered the consequences of his sin. You see that? 
And God, God loved these men. He loved them. Remember what I told you to start with. God does not want us to be lost. He does not want us to die and go to the devil's hell. He did not want these men to be lost. He loved them. No, that's not what we've been looking at. Not perfection. We're learning about faithfulness here and obedience. This is what the parable is about the talents. That is the main theme of the talent, the, the parable of the talent. Faithfulness and obedience. Not perfection, okay? We're not talking about perfection here. We're merely talking about doing what God says do and doing our best at it. And that's what we find in that parable. Let's see if that's right according to Scripture. 1 John 5, 1, 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now we get that, right? But in, anywhere in there you see perfection? You know, no. But we see a walk that we do. And by the way, he is bringing up somebody that says they do and don't. Right? And so we get that message, don't we? That we falter. And I'm not excusing sin by any means, any stretch of the imagination, but I recognize that I falter. You know, I have my faults and I sin and I stray and I stumble and on and on. But does that mean I'm not walking in the light? Absolutely not. Walking in the light. I'm walking in the light and I have confidence in God's grace. I certainly have confidence in Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for me on the cross and the blood that he shed to take care of those faults, those blemishes that I have. We need to lean on God for that and lean on the Lord for that. Well, 1 John 2, 1 through 2 says, my little children. Don't you like that? You ought to read that and let, let John talk to you. My little children. I'm writing this to you so that you may not sin. May not sin. Hmm. Did he say, I'm writing this to you that you won't sin? May not sin. But if anyone does sin, you're going to hell. You're doomed. Is that what it says? Look at this. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the expici expiation of our sins expiation of our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world now <clears throat> the difference here is we enjoy the blood the world is yet to enjoy it it's there for their taking and that's what he's saying there right for the sins of the whole world anybody that will come and drink of that fountain and come in contact with the blood of Christ will enjoy this right here with the advocate, one that would go to the Father on my behalf. Thanks, thanks that he's there, right? On my behalf and tell God and argue to have God to have mercy on me and to give me grace and give me help and save me, take me to heaven. But he's a good man. And you want Christ to argue that for you? Yeah, absolutely. He's not going to argue, with it, but he's not going to make that argument for you if you hadn't come to this point, this blood here. Blood of Christ. <clears throat> okay? What are we talking about here? Obedience and faithfulness and perfection. Right? We, don't, we can't be perfect, so we, but we try, don't we? We try to be as Christ-like as we possibly can and follow that great and perfect example that he left us and follow his example. <clears throat> well, what's the conclusion of our lesson this morning then? Only this, this right here. <clears throat> what, what about us? What about us? Do we know God? Do we know God as well as we thought we knew him? And <clears throat> Jenna made a comment in the class, and Jan did too, about studying and, and, and about how 
we are constantly growing. There may be some things you don't know about God. Right? I'm sure there's a lot of things we don't know about God, right? <clears throat> but we want to know more about God, don't we? But do we know Him as we thought we did? Have we reflected upon our lives this morning and asked ourselves, do we really know God like we should? Am I really pursuing my relationship with God in a way that by which I can know Him better? That's a good question, isn't it? I want to know God better. I want to, I want to be closer to God. We all ought to want to be closer to God. We should not ever have the attitude of this one talent man. Oh, Lord, I'm afraid. And I knew you was an austere man. You was hard. You was unfair. And you just, you just, you know, and you're really crooked. That's really what he was saying, right? You're really, you know, you just kind of, you sly and you crooked. And you imagine having an uh, attitude like that about God? <clears throat> We're not going to get very far, are we? The Bible reveals all we need to know about God. That's where it's at. We want to know about God? I can tell you some things about God, but the Bible's going to tell you everything about God. And so we ought to want to know and, and to pursue God <clears throat> and, and read and study and learn and try to learn all we can about God. I want to know more about God. And I hope you do too. We all should practice abandoning what we think we know about the Lord. And that, you know, you think about your concept of God before you come in contact with the Bible. And before you come in contact with the truth. And you have baggage with that, don't you? You have to really, man, you have to work on that stuff and, and think about what the world is going to do to you. And what the world is going to tell you. And so what we begin to do is we get these illusions, don't we, about God we talked about. So what we have to do is we have to practice abandoning those things. What we think we know about the Lord and accept what we know the Word of God reveals and work every day to know Him better. Work harder tomorrow than you did today. Know, know God and really understand God. And the more you understand the God, I'm going to tell you this. You know, you know what, the, what the, 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 the great thing about that is? The more you understand God, the happier you're going to be. And the better you're going to be for it. So this morning, let's try to be like those other guys in that, that, that parable. Let's be like the five talents and two talents. We go out and we, we want to know God. And we know God is it, it has our best interest at heart when he commands us to do things. And when he tells us things in the Bible that we don't need to be doing or things we need to do as we try to serve him.